Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. I'm liking this uh, rock star look you're 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 throwing today. Those who can't see, well, I mean, Matt... if you are a rock star, <laughs> eventually you have to start dressing like. <laughs> I mean, Matt's got. I mean, for those who can't see, yours on the podcast. I mean, your your hair is getting close to shoulder length here. <laughs> you got the you got the gray blazer and the black t shirt. You know. Uh, I mean, when you go out now yeah. in West Virginia, are there people looking at you like, who's the city slicker? <laughs> Big shot. Oh, I uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Charlie Daniels song where he's driving uh, through Jackson, Mississippi on a Saturday night and he tucks all that hair under up under his hat. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of my move. It's Charlie Daniels before you uh, went hardcore right wing. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I mean, I would have assumed that he was like, kind of left wing back then uh you know to a certain degree at least so it's interesting uh these how these careers evolve (laughs) i I always respected that charlie daniels literally to the day he died every day would tweet benghazi isn't going away it's such a shame because he put out some real his his greatest hits are are really good. I I like it. Um, and man, I mean the, uh, you know the fiddle playing on the devil went down to Georgia. I mean, what do you yeah? You know. Oh, and the South's gonna rise again. The South's gonna do it again, mm-hmm. which is about Southern music, mm-hmm. which may or may not be canceled according to the New York Times classic rock, but <laughs> not about the Civil War. Um, but the fiddle plan is amazing. He he was uh he will be missed. He will be missed. All right, let's get let's get into some business. Do you want to start Virginia? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, now you came around to Virginia. You came around on Virginia, Bill, uh, the last month. But but I do. I, I think we could go to the files where I said, "Yep, watch this. This could happen," and you poo pooed it. Well, we have to check the tape. So correct me if I'm <laughs> getting this wrong. I I definitely initially was totally dismissive of Yunkin because my understanding was he was just a Trumper and a Trumper wasn't going to get very far in Virginia. And, and you were telling me that critical race theory was going to change the game. And so where I would uh, quibble with you, you know, Matt Lewis vis-a-vis whatever it was October, August, or whatever it was. Uh, I don't think it's really critical race theory. I think that's oversimplifying it. Uh, as we talked last week, um, McAuliffe made the big gaffe in late September. I don't think parents should tell schools what to teach, which Yunkin shoved right back down his throat in multiple ads and hung a lot of different education complaints on that. Uh, there was very, very little talk of critical race theory in the ad campaign. And even when he talked about it in his rallies, he balanced it. He would say, I'm going to ban critical race theory, but absolutely we need to talk about the good and the bad of American history. We need to, we need to talk about race. You know, he, he, he wasn't, he was trying to signal to those moderate voters. I'm not saying we have to whitewash American history. There was a lot of calibration, dog whistling, um, but overt pleas to the middle that I didn't appreciate you know, in the summer and early fall. And I think complicates the argument that this just shows a critical race theory is, I mean, again, it's not, you know, no one's running on a critical race theory. <laughs> They're never going to say, hooray, critical race theory. Um, They're never going to say, we should talk about race in schools. Um, But, well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is such a weird or difficult topic in the sense that, you know, I, I think that like, there's the the defin there's the definition of critical race theory that's like the literal definition that is a very academic legal thing, and then there is the sense that uh, a lot of people on the left want to they don't really believe in kind of a colorblind as- aspiration anymore, um, and they. Uh, they kind of want to see everything through the prism of of race, um, and I think that that is kind of what I was picking. The re- people are really rejecting that, and I think um, 
a lot of white people are rejecting and then people who are kind of allied otherwise like like they they um they probably even voted for obama and biden but it seems like and this is just one area where i think the left has in the culture war area has kind of overreached and so i do think i was picking up on that and it's not exactly crt but it's part of a larger uh you know discussion well i mean there's there's a lot of <clears throat> elements to the education argument in the Yunkin campaign. You know, the thing that I saw most in the ads was not about CRT. It was saying things like, um, we've been lowering our standards. We're putting politics ahead of our kids, you know, that which you can interpret different ways. Uh, but the standards thing is about this move away from standardized testing, which again, Yunkin didn't say that. He didn't say, I love standardized testing. He said, we shouldn't lower the standards for our kids. So, I mean, that's the kind yeah. of thing where I bet if you pulled the Democratic messaging, because because McAuliffe in his ads was defending the move away from standardized testing. I bet if you pulled standardized testing, it would pull badly. If you pulled, we're lowering the standards for our kids, you know, the Republican message would, would resonate too. Yeah. Um, because people look but, at and the, isn't there a place is it in New York or something where they're getting rid of AP yeah, placement this, because it's doing that? You know, Boston it, it, and it's that. somehow deemed. Correct me if I'm wrong. I assume it's somehow deemed to be a tool of white supremacy or something. I mean, I, I don't know if there's an exact language, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a gifted program in New York City that's being scrapped because they're saying that there's evidence it is getting preference. It, it, the impact of it is racially um, disproportionate. Uh, and so, and you're seeing this in Boston too, where they're changing the admissions criteria for their, I don't know if they call it magnet schools or something else, but, um, they're, they're changing that criteria to ensure more racial, uh, diversity. Uh, and you know, the losing candidate in Boston's mayor's race, um, Asabi George, you know, was on the opposite side of that. Uh, but Michelle Wu, who, who favored the change, you know, she won going away. Boston's a much more progressive place the city than Virginia, the state. Uh, but even, you know, the, there's a piece that I wrote about CRT arguing that was not going to be a great boot for Republicans on the argument that it was not a great uh, political tool to win back the suburban college educated whites that that Republicans lost with Trump. And we've centered so much on Loudoun County in Virginia, which is this <coughs> suburban, exurban county that's moved red to blue over the past uh, decade or so. McAuliffe won Loudoun by by eleven points last I checked. I mean, maybe the numbers have shifted a little bit. Okay, but what but what did what did Biden win Loudoun by? I think he won it by more. Um, a year, right? Uh, so I but so the trend in Loudoun is the the trend in a college educated suburb over the course of the 20 years is still in the Democrats' direction. And McAuliffe won it eight years ago by like three or four points. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some weekening there. But, but again, I can't put on CRT. The, oh, the whole budget that was going on in Loudoun County, my yeah. too. Well, uh, I mean, in Loudoun County was was the uh, focal point of the whole transgender, you know, uh, restroom controversy debate there's there's also a fairfax um, county issue i mean fairfax county is also suburban northern virginia and this this is what prompted the gaff the mcauliffe gaff there are two books in the fairfax county high school library that had sexually explicit content that some parents wanted to get out of the library uh and one of them i know is written i mean it's it's a apparently it's a it's a fictional book but there's some some kind of graphical elements to it from the author. Uh, I don't know if this is literally factual in the author's uh, story, uh, but it depicts two fourth grade boys uh, having oral sex. Uh, again, I didn't read the book. I can't hear the context of that. I can't hear it saying like, hooray, fourth grade boys having oral well, sex. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, I haven't uh, read it either, Bill. Um, but that, that is the kind of thing where you can say, you know what, I mean, not saying this book should be banned, but maybe it's not the right thing for a school library. Um, yeah. And and in fact, the the two the two books got pulled temporarily for formal review. Uh, so it's that story that 
Youngkin was pushing in the debate because it was tied to this bill that McAuliffe vetoed out of an attempt to get a, a mom who wanted Toy Morrison's beloved not assigned to her high school son. Because it also has some explicit scenes in there, although obviously it's not a pornographic <laughs> book. Uh, and and McAuliffe tried to make that the issue. Hey, these guys want to ban Beloved. Uh, and that's why I vetoed this bill. Uh, so, you know, which which story, which anecdote are you being driven by uh, on election day? I can't know. There's too many things going on. Yeah. But it still seems but I to do me think that, that the gaff. Well, like the gaff definitely was a killer for McCall. I think that is the thesis. No, but I mean, I, I think the gaff betrayed a worldview. I mean, the gaff. <clears throat> he said, like, I don't think parents should be telling, a, you know, telling us how to teach their kids or, you know, whatever. I mean, like. I think he was being honest, like, I think that is a fundamental worldview difference. And I think obviously and parents who have, by the way, been taking on the burden of homeschooling for like a year or two now with the teachers unions, you know, jerking them around, I think we're especially not in the mood to be uh, told that they don't have a say in in their kids' education. Here's the thing, Matt. Um, I, I live in a very progressive city. Progressive parents go to school board meetings all the time and try to influence how their schools are run. Uh, so it's it's not a progressive worldview that all parents should have no say in how schools are run. Progressive parents do that all the time. Uh, what I think McCall, <clears throat> what, what's betrayed here uh, is people on the left don't like right-wing parents <laughs> coming in and trying to dictate school assignments and, and book library selections. But obviously you can't say that that bluntly because that's a far more polarizing thing to say. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so McAuliffe did not figure out how to thread that needle. Uh, I mean, if he, was, if he was more explicitly talking about Beloved, I mean, he, there's a way he could have articulated his point in a far more narrow way that could not be misinterpreted to say that none of you parents have anything to say, you know, let school boards run everything. And you know, young kids things like let the parents on the school boards. It's a total false dichotomy. School boards are elected by the public, yeah, which but, includes parents. No, but and that's parents true, go to but, school but, board but, meetings, but, which have public comment, and try to influence school board members. It's not like this. It's not a divide. They went to school. The one guy went to a school board meeting and they arrested him. I well, mean, you know, because well, you know, I've seen the video of that meeting. I mean, that meeting was was flooded by conservative parents who were being outright disruptive, chanting, waving signs. I mean, I've seen school board meetings here, like. People, there, there's public comment. You say your public comment at the microphone, then you sit down. You don't cause a ruckus because then you can't hold the meeting. These people were disrupting the meeting, making it impossible for it to run. And so they gaveled it to go into like some kind of executive session, I believe. And this one parent who understandably is angry that his child was sexually assaulted in the bathroom. I totally understand that. Um, although apparently he called the person who assaulted his daughter gender fluid, which appears not to be the case. Uh, uh, and the, I, I don't know what he did specifically to get just arrested. Some guy, just some guy wearing, just some guy who was wearing a skirt in the some, girl's bathroom. Well, some people do that. Actually, I mean, I mean, he, I mean, the guy, <laughs> you know, had, but, the guy but, but had previously Catholic had sexual liaisons with this with this girl in the girl's bathroom before. I'm not saying that means this wasn't an assault because he was found guilty. I sure it was, but it, it it was not a guy in a skirt sneaking in and trying and springing himself on somebody. Um. Anyway, point. I don't know what this guy did specifically to get arrested, but there was outright civil disobedience, perhaps some uncivil dis- disobedience going on that the people yeah. arresting him could not know his particular story and his particular reason for being yeah. upset. And that's the kind no, I'm of just saying, from and, it, and that kind of behavior at saying, school board meeting is not okay and should be criticized because it was it was not the normal democratic civil yeah. function of of public comment. I, I agree with everything you said in, in terms of you have to be respectful. You you can't let the mob, you can't let the mob take over. But from this one guy's standpoint, you know, this horrible thing happens to his daughter. You say, well, just go to the school board meeting. And so he goes. And before he has a chance to talk, 
they decide we're not going to like take your we're not going to let you. I mean, I understand why this guy flipped. Oh, I mean, you know? yeah, I, I, I don't I get that. But <laughs> but we should understand that that whole episode. Does is not. Lib- liberal school board people wanting to shut people up. <laughs> Um, cause that's it, what was happening. It was a lot more complicated than that. So the other thing I would say is, so my, you know, Bill, it, it, I think my assessment is now pretty much conventional wisdom, right? There were atmospheric reasons why this happened. There's historic, you know, h- history suggests that, that there's going to be a backlash against the incumbent party. Um, I think that it's pretty amazing that Trump was kept on the sidelines that he mm-hmm. didn't screw this up. I think Trump could have uh, ruined this potentially the way he uh, sabotaged Georgia. Amazingly, he didn't. Uh, so there's kind of atmospheric things that were part of the story. But I think the conventional wisdom is that Youngkin demonstrated that it is possible for the right kind of candidate to hold the Trump base and bring in suburban, college-educated, independent, soccer moms, whatever. Um, Simultaneously, I believe that, so Terry McAuliffe was a bad candidate and a retread, totally wrong for this moment. Uh, But having said that, I do believe that the left, whether that's due to, um, you know, stalling the wife, Go in the voicemail. Um, whether that's due to stalling the agenda or, you know, or whether it's due to, um, you know, kind of the uh, overreach on things like uh, the culture wars. Uh, I think the left, what we saw was also a backlash against the left and um, and kind of woke politics. And instead of Bill, I, I do have to say, you know, now I don't want to conflate like politicians with people on Twitter, even if those people on Twitter are blue check marks and college professors and prominent writers. Um, but it does seem like the message has not been received that 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 at least certainly people on the left are not looking at Virginia and saying, wow, we better get our act together or we're, it's going to be a bloodbath next year. It seems like what I've seen a lot of is like, what happened in Virginia is that Glenn Youngkin is a white supremacist and he's Donald Trump in a fleece vest. And what this was is white lash that that, you know, so I and white supremacy and attacking white women. It, it seems to me that the message has not been received. Well, but, but and the you, left is you're gonna, you're you're, they'll, quote, they'll you're they'll quoting people, down. you know, who are people on Twitter or people who are MSNBC pundits. You're not quoting Democratic politicians, right? <laughs> No, 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 you're right. But I think that here's my new theory, Bill, that um, Donald Trump is to Republicans what people in on MSNBC are to Democrats. <laughs> well, <laughs> in other words, they are pain in the focus. And they also draw and they also drive the party. Ultimately, they will push the party to do what they want. Uh, whether it's smart or not. Well, I I think, I mean, I think the analysis that, you know, Youngkin won because people are racist is just too simplistic. Uh, Now, uh, and I I also want to say, you you talk about soccer moms, you know, what we're seeing in the exit poll is that, you know, college-educated white women still vote a Democrat. The the bigger shift was non-college white women. Uh, That's sort of similar to the, the, uh, bifurcation in 2016, you know, with, um, you know, some people were like, you know, white women gave it to Trump. It's like, well, not really college, college, get white women still win with Hillary, in fact, more so than, you know, four years ago, but there, yeah. there was a <clears throat> counteracting shift with non-college white women. Um, and we did see the red areas of Virginia get redder. So it's not just that Youngkin held the Trump base, Youngkin juiced the Trump base. You know, there was a surge in yeah, Republican amazing. turnout at the same time there was a shift among swing voters. We see in the exit poll data that independent voters went, you know, uh, four years ago were for Gillespie over Northern, the Republican over the Democrat, 
by three points and Yunkin over McAuliffe by nine points. And, he, and even within that, those independents uh, were a, a plurality Trump constituency in 2017 and a hugely Biden constituency in 2021, like almost 20 points Biden. So, it's a, so it's a, it's the independent group was a group that shifted blue in 2020, but, sh- but shifted more towards Yunkin in 2021. Uh, so both things were happening. You're ju- so I think you're juicing the Trump base with CRT, with the transgender issues. Not those things have, have no relevance at all in this discussion. Yeah, but Youngkin yeah. was much more careful <clears throat> in his in his above the radar messaging, and again, even when talking about CRT, to talk about it in a very balanced way to not sound racist. So it's not like he's triggering the latent racism of the swing voters necessarily. They may look at Youngkin as not being racist and not doing racist things. Uh, so. And I think, but but I think that's the accurate. When you say they may look at, that's what it is, right? I mean, do, you know, do you think that? I mean, I, I would view Youngkin as a force for good. Uh, and and by the way, I was very happy to see um, him with Ralph Northam yesterday, the current governor of Virginia, and both of them, I thought. We're acting very, uh, you know, conciliatory, I mean, yeah. and and it's just very. I mean, honestly, it was like very. I, I think that there was a part of the story. I think there was like a pent up demand for people who want to vote Republican but can't bring themselves to vote for Trump. Northam was like coming like a homecoming. You get to vote Republican again. The Democrats had a chance, I think, to bring people like me over, and they decided. They didn't even try to do that. So, and but it's also very comforting to see adults, you know, the Northam and Youngkin, acting like uh, civilized human beings. So let me me ask you, Matt: Are you in love with Glenn Youngkin? (laughs) No. Uh, Where I'm in like, I I like Youngkin. I I I hope he does well. I don't. You know, is Youngkin the is Youngkin the model? For how Republicans should run, period. I think that the I I think that if you want to win states like Virginia, then I don't know if Yunkin's the model in the sense of like I don't think people should imitate him. It just doesn't work trying to be who you're not. But I do think if you can find someone who is able to hold or even grow the Trump base, um, but also went over suburban suburbanites like that. I think that's the model. Definitely. Well, well, just yeah. to be more specific. I mean, and I, I feel like this is the kind of thing you've always advocated in the past. You know, be Reaganite, be sunny, be genial, <laughs> um, be aware that you can't win on just the base alone. You know, Yunkin was, a, you know, was it an angry candidate? <laughs> Um, wasn't an overtly div- divisive candidate. He, his, his own, again, we talked to critical race theory, talked about it in a way that still indicated to people yeah. that, <clears throat> you know, we still need to talk about yeah. race and, 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 and not, uh, draw division. Uh, he was trying to paint the Democrats as the culture war agitators. They're the ones being well, divisive. Well, and, and we've had this talk before and I don't want to be divisive here, but I do think that, by and large, conservatives are playing defense. Like we're trying to conserve something and progressives are trying to change things. So, and sometimes it's for the better and sometimes it's for the worse, but like they are, um, agitators is the wrong word. They're, they're sort of the aggressors. I would say that the left are the aggressors in the culture war by and large. And that, Conservatives are playing defense. Well, I don't want to Trump, I don't relitigate this. You know, we, we talked about it last week. Yeah, you know, we're gonna get, Texas does counteract that theory right now. Okay. Well, it depends when the game starts. I would say that they were the that the left were the aggressors in 1973, but it depends when you start the, the when you start counting. I guess. Now, how do you think Yunkin should govern, considering how he? campaigned you know is it should he be more like a larry hogan or a charlie baker that says you know what 
I won, but this is still a fairly democratic state. It's a light blue state. I, I didn't win on being uber right wing and I should not over, over interpret this mandate or keep in mind, it's Virginia. You have a, you have a trouble of one. He can't run again. I mean, yeah. could run for Senate, could run for president. I would run for governor again. You know, should you be like a Mitt Romney in Massachusetts saying, hey, I've got to run for president. Who cares if I'm in Massachusetts? I'm going to do lots of super Republican things and show to the Republican base that they can trust me to run for president someday. Well, look, I think that by and large, um, he should be a competent governor. And um, I don't think he should try to seek retribution or against his enemies or anything. I think a lot of being a governor is like a technocratic thing, you know, making sure the garbage gets picked up or whatever. Like, I, I think he has those uh, chops and I think he'll be, I hope that he'll be just a competent governor. I do think though, that, you know, he was, a, to the degree that there was a mandate uh, for him to be elected, that he should make reforms in that direction. So uh, when it comes to making sure that parents have a voice, like, that would be the kind of thing that I think he should support and not in a crazy way, not in an irresponsible way, but that I think he, you know, so I think it's, it's a combination really, you know, part of it is just being a competent, decent, good governor. And I also though, obviously think he should try to, you know, do conservative reforms uh, in a smart, responsible way. I mean, I think like Larry Hogan, probably that's kind of not far from his model. I mean, the, where I think he might get in trouble, again, thinking about what's going to feel healing, what's going to feel divisive. I mean, I don't know exactly the rules in Virginia. I would think he would have the latitude uh, as the governor who can pick his you know, department, head of the Department of Education. Uh, I don't think you need the legislature to get involved there. I, th I think you could probably say it is hereby the policy of Virginia public schools that parents can opt out of sexually explicit assignments to uh, any reading yeah. material that has sexually explicit language in it. That seems uh, perfectly reasonable to well, me. And I suspect that I suspect few people would, few people I, I, would I, pick them up I suspect it. that you're going to have a whole bunch of really controversial <laughs> moments in a lot of, you know, blue to purple school districts. That's going to feel like a cascade of division. Uh, I mean, at least, at least it's a possibility. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know how smooth that kind of policy is going to go down. Yeah. Um, there is stuff going on, you know, the left controls the culture. They control sports now, which is a weird turn. Um, they control by and large Hollywood academia. And, you know, I don't know if you saw that. New York Times piece. It was Jeremy Peters and someone else <clears throat> about this this dad who was like an Obama. I think he was an Obama Biden Clinton voter who, um, because his daughter was doing like was doing homeschooling like on Zoom with the teacher, he overheard the teacher talking about like white men as modern day slaveholders or something to that effect, <clears throat> and that kind of radicalized him. Um, Stuff like that's happening and going on, oh, and so, then so, there's stuff. So, some of these stories get get overblown. So we got. There's know. also just stuff in the culture, and again, this isn't Terry McAuliffe's fault, but like, you know, Colin Kaepernick comparing the NFL draft to slave auctions or something. Like, it's just I, I think that there are a lot of people who like were pretty down with the cause and tolerant and even allies who are like, all right, this is going too far. And I think that the stuff in the culture, you know, it's, how do you divide, how do you divide, like, I'm voting for, I'm in the po political realm now, and I'm voting for, you know, Terry McAuliffe, <clears throat> sort of a standard issue Democrat. How do you separate the stuff happening on, on Twitter and on TV from that? It's, 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 it's challenging to do. Let me ask you one more Virginia question before we turn to um, Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this year, um, 
Uh, so this is a April article from the New York Times. Uh, Democrat Governor Ralph Northam this week kept a multi-year liberal movement for greater ballot access by setting off on sweeping legislation to recreate pivotal elements of the Federal Voting Rights Act that was struck down by the Supreme Court's conservative majority in 2013. Virginia has, alone among the states of the former Confederacy, Virginia has become a voting rights bastion, increasingly encouraging its citizens, especially people of color, to exercise their democratic rights. Uh, they repealed the state's voter ID law. They enacted 45 days of no-excuse absentee voting, made Election Day a state holiday, and enacted automatic voter registration for anyone who receives a Virginia driver's license. So here you have a state that's practically the gold standard of voting access from a Democratic perspective, and the Republicans just won a governor's race with juiced Republican turnout. Yeah. What is stopping Republicans from embracing some kind of voting rights law now that, it, to my mind, it's abundantly clear, and, I, and I've been saying this for months, Matt, <laughs> expanded voting access is not bad for Republicans. No, Bill, you've been at the forefront of that. And I think, you know, as you've noted, like both sides seem to think that uh, ballot access will help Democrats and hurt Republicans. Both sides seem to believe that. And there doesn't seem to be much evidence for that. As you know, I I think that um, that we should have voter ID, um, not because I think it's going to help Republicans. I just think it's obviously the right, the smart policy, like just to avoid voter fraud. Um, so I just I would support, you know, if, if I were Yunkin, I would you know try to uh, to require voter ID, but not because I think it's going to help Republicans because I don't. But just because it seems like an obvious reform that you would have if you were thinking rationally about well, it. Well, I mean, I mean, Democrats have already said, well, we'll we'll have some sort of voter ID in, in what we would be yeah. willing to pass. You know, I, I think and let me just say, I I voted. I, I don't live in Virginia anymore, but I voted many times in Virginia, in Alexandria, Virginia, which has got to be a you know pretty bluest of the blue areas of, of, of Virginia. And I'm pretty sure they always made me show my, <laughs> made me show my license when I voted or at least asked me to. Well, I think they so, did. I mean, they, they, this, the Democrats just changed that law. So now oh, this lo- just changed. This okay. just changed. Just changed. Okay. Um, but my belief so in effect for this election. I, I think it's a bad idea, but obviously it didn't stop Glenn Youngkin, right? <laughs> do you have, do you have voter ID in West Virginia? I've only voted here once, I think, so I don't remember. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure you had to. Really? I mean, but I don't remember. This was just you know last November, right? You voted yeah, for president. I, vote, I voted. Did you have? Did you, the, did you have to pull out your voted. driver's license and show it to them when you voted? Probably. I don't remember. Probably. I I, I don't. I I have not had to do that, in Massachusetts. I go to the polls. They ask me my address. I give it to them like, verbally, yeah. and they check their list and they say, "This is your name," and I say, "Yes," and that's it. And uh, no problems yet. <laughs> yeah. It just seems like, you know, showing your ID is the kind of thing you have to do a lot. Like, I remember going on MSNBC and fighting with, I don't know, Al Sharpton or somebody. <clears throat> and I'm like, I had to show my license to get in this building. They wouldn't let me in <laughs> here without my light, without showing an ID. And they were, it, 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 it was, a pointless argument because uh, whoever the host was, it might have been Dylan Radigan, I don't remember, but whoever the host was, was like, yeah, but voting is more of a more, you know, getting, not not everybody has the right to get into this building. Every, you know, everybody has a right to vote. And I was like, yes. And that's why it's so precious that we must protect it and make sure that it's not being disenfranchised. So, um, but this, is even, the, but, but this is even the biggest hang up now for a federal voting mm-hmm. rights law. There's just still a confusion, I think, amongst the two parties, but who these laws benefit politically. Yeah. And I think we have a additional data point. I think there are there were already data points suggesting that was um fallacious. Uh now we have a fresh data point that perhaps I, I think if Joe Manchin was savvy, he'd be out there with a megaphone right now saying, hey guys, look, this is not gonna hurt you. Let's let let's find some sort of sweet spot here. It doesn't have to be the entirety of our bill, but we can do something along yeah. these lines that you feeling like this is out to uh, undermine you or till. Or, well, I would or, totally be okay with Saturday elections or the 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 holiday or whatever. 
It's fine by me. So I'm just but you got to show your right. West Virginia enacted a new voter ID voter ID law in 2018. They didn't used to have one, I think, but they now they do. Um. Oh, really? That's interesting. Interesting. So, um, I, I don't want to stand for too long because I got some work I got to get done. Um, but. Uh, so last I checked, where this is Friday morning, so again we're uh, <laughs> at the risk of screwing ourselves yeah. by being behind the news, uh, the news curve uh, once this gets uploaded. But it seems like Democrats in the House are going to pass both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and their version of Build Back Better even though it is not a version signed off of signed off by Joe Manchin, at least, or, or it's like Kirsten Sinema. Um, they seem to be pretty far along in the negotiations with them, but they haven't crossed every T. And as far as I can tell, house progressives who have been insisting for months that they would not pass the infrastructure bill until Initially, it was that the, the Senate would have to pass reconciliation completely. And then it was modified slightly to, okay, if we have agreement on the exact legislative text, we would then do it. But now it is, okay, we have legislative text that we like, <laughs> that, <laughs> or that it's acceptable to us, which is largely influenced by Joe Manchin. It is half the size of the bill we wanted to do in the first place. It's cut out a bunch of things that we wanted to have in there, but hey, at least it's something. Now we'll do the infrastructure bill, which will get sent to Biden uh, perhaps tonight, tomorrow, uh, even though the Senate is still going to futz with Build Back Better. Um, yeah. So just to, to my mind, uh, I mean, I think number one, uh, this says to me that but if, they, if they had done this a week ago or two weeks ago, it might have been nice for Terry McCullough. Right? Yeah, I mean, I can't know if it literally would have changed the entire game, but at least it would have been like a a day of headlines that were not about education, maybe two days, something that you talk about on the stump that wasn't being on defense. You know, would that have got him two points? I don't know, but uh, it would, couldn't hurt to try. Uh, and there's nothing new, though. I mean, they could have, if this is what they're going to do. They could have done this a month ago, probably, right? I, I, mean, I mean, progressives in the House could have just accepted the infrastructure bill when it was done and not even made a hostage-taking threat at all. They, they, they weren't obligated to do that. They made a calculation. I mean, not wholly unreasonable. I'm not saying that they were you know, total morons for thinking this. There is a plausible argument to make to have done it. But... We now do have the hindsight and say your notion that holding back the bipartisan infrastructure bill was going to gain you leverage and prevent Manchin and Cinema from dictating the terms of this bill unilaterally, that belief was proven wrong. Manchin and Cinema mm -hmm. have almost totally dictated the terms of this bill. Uh, and progressives, in my opinion, a little after the fact, told themselves, well, what Manchin and Sinema really want is to kill it. So, and so when Manchin says to Bernie Sanders, I'm comfortable with zero, I believe him, and I'm going to accept anything that he gives me because it's better than zero. And look, you know I'm a pragmatist. I, I think that's perfectly fine pragmatist logic. I think something is better than nothing. But it is hardly evidence that the negotiation tactic that progressives employed had any value from their perspective. The bill got cut in half uh, after that tactic was deployed. Uh, and so I think it could, it could have, one, not been tried at all. I mean, I, I can't know what would have been produced afterwards. You, you can tell me what would have been zero. Maybe. But there's no demonstrable evidence of that. There, there is no evidence that that is what Manchester truly wanted. That's just mind reading. Uh, and you certainly could have made this conclusion, as you said, a week ago, two weeks ago, when it was already clear that this bill was getting cut, progressives were going to accept that cut. So why not take what the win that you have in hand ahead of November 2nd? I'm Surely that would, that, that would have been worth trying. 
The other point, too, is, um, and again, they're just going to, really, the thing that will pass today is, assuming it passes, uh, is bipartisan, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is probably pretty popular. Um, but they're trying to, you know, they're still trying to pass the Build Back Better thing. And it does remind me a little bit of the Scott Brown election, you know, which they were trying to do Obamacare. Voters in Massachusetts <laughs> replaced Ted Kennedy with Scott Brown. I'm aware. <laughs> and the Democrats' response was, oh, I guess we'll just have to pass Obamacare some other way. Like we, <laughs> you know, so let's, let's push it through, you know, however we can. And instead of like, wow, we should take a step back and reconsider, like may maybe we're going too far. And anyway, you could certainly make an argument that they did the right thing on principle and that they were bravely accepting electoral defeats in 2010. Um, but it did happen. And I just, it feels to me like this is kind of similar. Like Democrats are not taking, you know, they're not looking to Virginia as a sign of like, wow, we better like pump the brakes. Well, I, I think I think the anecdote that you give is an argument for doing what Democrats did. They have a signature piece of legislation that greatly expanded health insurance coverage for people because they didn't get spooked because of one bad election. Uh, it, it, it was it may have been bad short term politically, um, but it's also possible they would have gotten killed in the midterms regardless. And they made sure to get something done that was important while they had the ability to do so. Um, uh, certain, now, there was a notion going into this. And look, I, I wrote in May that Democrats had a shot of defying historical patterns and holding Congress in the midterms. Uh, that re would require... Uh, Handling a crisis deftly. I mean, every time this has happened in history, it's because it's because there was a crisis that was managed deftly. Uh, maintaining party unity while the opposition is divided, which is the, the reverse of the normal midterm pattern, which is the president's party is divided and the opposition is unified. Uh, now, what we see in Tuesday's election is the normal historical pattern. Uh, the Democrats are divided, maybe a little deflated. Uh, while Republican opposition is juiced, um, and you know swing voters are tilting, you know the Republicans' way, uh, which is a very strong sign that 2022 is going to be terrible for Democrats. Uh, we're no matter what. I mean, if they if they stop Build Back Better and said, okay, forget it, that would be a base killer for Democrats, and they would have a terrible midterm. Now they may have a terrible midterm anyway, but they should get done what they can get done. Yeah. Uh, and I would just say I would just say, look, I, politically speaking, things you're saying are, are, are certainly plausible, if not likely. And I, and I I even admire and respect people who put their policies ahead of the politics or elections. Like, even though I don't like the social spending, I can respect people who uh, who are not deterred. I would say, though. The thing that bothers me a little bit about it is this kind of goes back to that father who tried to go to a school board meeting and they wouldn't let him talk. The voters are trying like this isn't like a bump in the like. This is the voters telling you, hey, you need to slow down. And so when you choose to ignore it, you're basically telling the voters, you know, you have this mechanism for contacting us and for signaling us on how you feel about our, our agenda. And you use the only mechanism at your disposal to alert us an election. And rather than recalibrate or do what like Bill Clinton did after 94, we're gonna basically say like, we're not really listening to you voters. And I do think that there there is a certain frustration that hits the electorate when they try to go through the usual means of signaling politicians via the electoral process and uh, their concerns are, are are ignored. Well, I don't think there's anything in the New Jersey and Virginia elections that says Democrats don't do Build Back Better. We don't like it. Please stop. <laughs> there's no polling to suggest that. Um, 
you know, there's concerns about inflation. Uh, and if you think that's going to add to inflation, you know, then Democrats should maybe think twice. But there's an argument that it's not going to contribute to inflation. Uh, now, Scott Brown and Scott Brown was running against Obamacare. <laughs> um, so like that was a gutsier or more dismissive, you have know, based on your perspective, yeah. approach to say, I don't care if Scott Brown won while attacking Obamacare. We're still going to do Ob- Ob- Obamacare. And I think the justification of that is. Scott Brown ran on a distortion of what this bill is going to do. We have some, you know, Barack Obama won an election also running on a health care reform uh, with a pretty big mandate. And he has an obligation to follow through on that and prove to the public that's good, that they're going to like it, which by 2012, by 2016, by 2020, they did. I mean, even though Trump won, they, uh, the numbers for Obamacare kept going up and up and up and the Republicans could not reveal it. Um, so I do wonder, I mean, and all that's right. And look, I'm a fan of Edmund Burke, who basically said, paraphrasing here, your elected officials don't owe you their vote. You know, they owe you their judgment. And so I'm with you on that. However, I would say that some of the um, division and, and intense, intense dislike of Obama, people tend to think it's all race or something. Even though, once again, a lot of people who voted for Obama then later voted for Trump. But I do think that when Obama basically said, and it wasn't just in 09 when he lost Virginia and New Jersey, he, he, he replicated this again when he lost midterms. He didn't listen to the vote. He didn't recalibrate. He didn't triangulate. The voters tried to tell him at like midterms, hey, pump the brain. And they, they, he didn't listen. Now, look. He has every right not to listen, but I think some of the anger and and div- division, frustration is really a good word for it. You know, frustration I, I, came from that. I think there is frustration. I, I would characterize it differently, and, and I and I think there is a parallel in 2009, 2010, and today in this respect. Um, you know, when Obama was doing healthcare reform and Wall Street reform, and um, he's also focusing a lot of of Afghanistan talk around this time. Um, there was a complaint. Why aren't you focusing on jobs? We're in this recession. You know, the recession's still going. Why aren't you focusing on jobs? Now, the fact is, like, they, they already passed the American Recovery Act. Um, uh, it wasn't like they were doing something on jobs, but it wasn't like a day to day thing. And then eventually, Obama did pro- propose the American Jobs Act, which Republicans blocked, and even Democrats were lukewarm about some of them. Uh, that didn't go anywhere. So it's, not, so it's not like they weren't trying to do things on jobs or and weren't doing things on jobs. Like jobs did grow, in fact. But the day-to-day news coverage, the day-to-day legislative activity was about long-range reforms, not my immediate concern. Uh, and that's an inherent tension for Democrats because they run on ambitious long-range reforms. Uh, but a lot of voters, especially in the middle, care about the immediate. You know, what, what, what am I mad about today? What is inconvenient to me today? And aren't thinking, you know, five, 10 years down the road. Uh, today, what's the immediate? The immediate is COVID. The immediate is vaccines. The immediate is supply chain disruptions that are pandemic related. Uh, all these little inconveniences that keep occurring. Um, uh, uh, Despite that, you told me, Democrats, you're going to be more competent than Trump. You're going to take this more seriously than Trump. Now, again, Biden is doing things. It's not like he isn't working on the pandemic or doesn't care about supply chain disruption. Um, but that's what's on top of mind for a lot of people. It's I mean, so it's not that they they hate Build Back Better, but a lot of people don't get why am I why are you talking about this? Why are you still squabbling about this? Why is this occupying my headspace for three months when I'm fresh about something else entirely? Uh, and, you know, and maybe by November, 2022, the pandemic will be in a better place. Good jobs number today. Kids are getting vaccines starting this week. I got my appointment for my nine-year-old, you know, for Saturday. Maybe we're going to be a little bit better about things a few months from now. Uh, I can't know, but I do think there's always going to be that tension to live for Democrats because they want to do long range things and a good chunk of voters don't think about long range things. This is a good show, Bill. I like this one. Uh, I like all of our shows, Matt. They're no no bad DMZ shows. 
they're all good in different ways. It's like it's like your children, you know, you, you know, you, you love them all differently, but but equally. I do have to run because I got I got uh, a deadline to hit. All right, we'll see you back here in the DMZ next week. All right, take care.